is back. That uh, sharp multi-system machine that I did the mode switch on, um, what was it, a couple weeks back? It's back. It's eating tapes now. We have a mechanical problem. This is why I don't like looking at these really old machines, but uh, let's see what's causing this one. One of the downsides to working on this old vintage equipment is, well, old vintage equipment is not that reliable. And sharp VCRs weren't the best machines when they were new. And when they're 30 odd years old, they're no better. This one here was in before, and uh, now apparently it's eating tapes. Let's find out why. If you're wondering what happened to the corner of my cassette, <clears throat> well, this is what happens with plastic, even on tapes when it gets old. It gets brittle and it just breaks. All these old VHS tapes, the plastic on them is becoming very brittle, so be careful with your tapes. Don't drop them because the shell could shatter. Okay, the tape is spilling. Maybe we have a broken belt now. Nope. It just retracted the tape in. So the belt is not broken, but it didn't certainly was not taking up the tape. What happens if I put it into rewind? If I can figure out where the buttons are on this. Okay, it appears that maybe the drive idler is sticking. Let's take a look at the drive idler. Yeah, because it eats my tape. So this is going to have an idler below the chassis that flips back and forth to drive the take up or the supply spool. Good chance it's getting stuck somehow. To access that, we're going to remove the bottom. Okay, you can hear it. Let's get a close-up look at this. It's going to be in this clutch assembly where the problem is. So as I rotate, you can see that this clutch assembly, this should be swinging right up there and engaging. So there's not enough tension on here to make the clutch swing back and forth. And typically what it's going to be is it's going to be on this actual little gear itself here. There should be a felt pad in here and applying some tension so that as this rotates there's a bit of resistance on the gear so that it will flip up. So let's uh, let's remove it. And I want to take this gear out too because there should be a little bit of resistance. This is just a straight gear, right? There's, there's nothing fancy about this. Zoom the camera out a bit so you guys can see it a little more on the bench here. So this is just a straight gear, but this is the clutch here. And this slides up and down. It's controlled by this shaft here. But this, there should be, oh, there is some tension on here, so why it's not moving it up? Interesting, but this is, uh, this is sticking a bit here on, on this. So the lubricant on this shaft here has dried out. And that is sticking a bit. See the clutch on these, the slip clutch is actually on the reels themselves. When we look at the reel tables in here, you'll see that there are two gears. If I get a close up of it here, this is the two part gear, right? One side drives the hub directly and the other side drives through uh, a reduction clutch so when it's in play this is up like this when it's in play so that the the teeth 
of this gear here mesh with the white gear uh, uh, they're on both the, t the, the supply and the take up it's going to mesh with the white gear if you notice if I hold the white gear here by my with my finger and I reach around on the other side and I turn the hub you'll see that the black gear turns this is the clutch this is what provides your tension on reverse search and forward search and play to go into full fast forward and rewind this has to drop down so that it will engage with the black gear so I'm just going to put a bit of lubricant down here while I've got it apart. Uh, this is not what's causing the problem. The problem's actually on the clutch, but since I've got the bottom off it here, we'll put a bit of uh, Melly Coat grease on here, and then we'll tackle the problem, which is that uh, pendulum gear. It doesn't have enough uh, tension on it to uh, engage and swing back and forth. I see a secondary problem on this and that is this gear here there's a spring that's missing because normally there's a spring that pushes this down against this felt pad that's on the bottom that gives it some tension so that it will um, provide enough resistance to flip this back and forth and that little spring that's missing on the top so we'll put this gear back on and I'll show you what I'm talking about Here's the top side of the gear here, and normally there is a, a spring on top here to push down on the gear, and it's clipped on with a clip that goes across the top here, and that clip is missing that holds the spring down. What that spring does is it provides a little downward force on the gear so that when the when the when the uh, shaft from below turns it creates enough of resistance that this will flip back and forth very quickly as you can see now I'm turning it and look at how slow it's going from one side to the other so what I need to do is I need to get a spring put a spring in there uh, a small spring to put some downward force on here and then have find some way to, to clip it in place so there's no lip some of them used to cut washer on top but this one doesn't when you shake things enough you never know what's gonna fall out that is what holds the spring in place now I gotta see if the spring is sitting in here somewhere. We'll shake some more and see if anything else is gonna fall out of this unit. Oh, more stuff's falling out. The pieces all fell out. I've got the three pieces that fell out of this unit. Cool. Now I'll be able to fix it. Of course, also when shaking it, the gear fell out. So this is how this goes together. The spring sits on top here. This piece sits on top of the spring and fits into these little teeth. And then this cap fits on top and puts it all together. That's what has to go back into this thing to uh, make it work. And that's where they go, right there. So first, the idler sits in there. See, the problem with these boomerangs is that uh, the guy brings this thing back and he thinks, well, this is, uh, it's hard to collect, you know, it's hard to charge somebody a second time for something that, that breaks, but it's, it's totally beyond my control because this unit worked fine when it left here because uh, it wouldn't have played the tape, it would have eaten the tape had this been at fault. So this unit worked fine when it left here, but he gets it home and a piece falls apart on it and uh, it comes back. And that's, that's the problem when you work on any of this old crap is that people expect that you can guarantee that this thing's going to last any length of time and unfortunately you can't guarantee things. It's part of the, part of the problem when you work with, with old electronics. We used to refer to this in the business as uh, you know, the boss would always say I don't want to get married to it. I don't want to get married to it. And that was what uh, we referred to as you know, when you got something old like this, old parts break. You fix one thing and uh, shortly after something else breaks and, you know, nobody wants to pay for it and then you're doing it for free and then you get pissed off and you don't want to do it anymore. I'm trying to do this so you guys can see it, so I'm kind of, 
I'm kind of at a disadvantage here because I can't really see what I'm doing. It's easy when you can see what you're doing. fun part to this is I got to get this all together and push the spring in place and put the top on it without having it spring apart and fly off in my face. So I got to get a lot of light in here so I can see what the heck I'm doing. Now this goes down with the, the nub facing down. That's what holds the uh, plastic piece in place. Actually, I think I probably would put this on to here first. Put this on to here like that. And then I can put the whole piece together and shove it in place and see if it'll, if it'll hold. So put that on there like that and let's get to line it up with the gear. push it down like that now I gotta put something out there to stop this from coming off again because it likely would pop off again it popped off once so it's the reason it's popped off oh there's a little crack in it I can see there's a tiny little crack right there where my fingernail is pointing on this plastic and that is why it popped off so we have to uh, secure this down with some glue or something otherwise it's just going to pop off again so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just mix up a little tiny bit because this this part doesn't the top doesn't turn the slip is below it that the plastic piece here spins the plastic bushing below it spins with the spring but the black top does not so I'm going to mix up some glue and we're going to put a little bit of epoxy on the top there to stop that thing from popping off otherwise it's just going to fly off again and we're back to square one because we have worn out plastic parts and to try and get one of these for a sharp multi-system VC90 uh, it's going to be impossible It'd be impossible to get a part like that for a more modern machine never mind never mind a multi-system machine which wasn't sold much in North America this was more sold in Europe because they had umpteen dozen TV standards. Okay, they had basically three color systems, PAL, CCAM, and Middle East CCAM, and NTSC. So basically four, four standards, four video standards, but something like 20 odd broadcast standards based on the four main color systems, well, three main color systems. CCAM and Middle East CCAM were essentially almost identical the difference was the French did things differently the carriers used for the color subcarriers were different on the French VTRs the broadcast system the color was the same but the way that they the way that they down converted the color and recorded it on the VCR was different on the French versions of CCAM than the Middle East CCAM so if you had a tape that was recorded by a Middle East CCAM machine and you tried to play it on a French machine, it would play in black and white. And uh, if you tried to play a French CCAM tape on a Middle East CCAM uh, player, it would play back in black and white. So four, four video, actually five, because it was, I forgot about NTSC 4.43, but basically three color systems, PAL, CCAM, and NTSC. Um, by the time it was broadcast over the air, there was like 20 different, 20 different ways of broadcasting. And it all had to relate with the FM uh, carrier for the uh, sound. NTSC used 4.5 megahertz, for example, and I believe PAL, I think it was 5.6 5 or 6.8. Anyway, I never studied PAL and uh, 
CCAM uh, broadcasting. In fact, some countries probably use 5.6 and others use 6.8 or 6.2 for their FM uh, carrier. But that was the big difference between the broadcast standards was IF frequency and the location of the color and the, uh, the FM carrier for the sound. Anyway, while I'm, uh, I'm going to mix up some epoxy, get some epoxy on there, we'll let it dry and then we'll test this thing out. So I've got some five minute epoxy here. Uh, the epoxy and the activator. We'll just use an old Q-tip to mix it up. Normally I use JB Weld, but I didn't have any and I didn't feel like going to the store and getting some, so I had some old five minute epoxy. This stuff's probably 20, 30 years old. There's not much left in it either. It's some of this old the page is I use it right down to the end of the tube. But that's okay, because this stuff doesn't go bad. And I don't need much of it. I just need a little dot to put on top of the uh, of the retainer there just to hold it in place so that it doesn't pop off. And we'll let it set for a while and then we'll test it. So there the epoxy is now mixed. I usually use like a a, a old cardboard type q-tip or plastic just because the stuff if it hardens on your screwdriver it's almost impossible to get off plus the screwdriver might have oil and stuff on it from you know from lubricating things and we don't want to contaminate it so let's let's get the let's get the epoxy on here to secure this in place so I'm just going to put a little bit right on the top here So it's setting up, but we can uh, we can turn this so you can see what it does. With the tension on there, the, the uh, pendulum gear moves back and forth like it's supposed to. It doesn't get stuck. And that's what that uh, spring and keeper is for. Uh, I'm just going to let it uh, set up. It's only been a couple minutes and it's, it's epoxy typically. It says it's five minute epoxy. And it is, yeah it is getting it's getting hard now, but I'm just going to leave it set for another few minutes just so that it completely, just so it completely sets up. So while the glue sets, I can take this opportunity to put the bottom back on the unit as I don't need to get into the bottom anymore. So it's now working as it's supposed to, as you can see the tape is moving. We'll try the different modes. Try rewind. Fast forward. Play. There we go. It's playing. I'll show you the picture. I feel a little safer showing you this. Oh. It might help if I put it in the right speed here. What am I in here? There we go. I hit the button. It was in PAL. So this machine's fixed again. Hopefully it's going to stay fixed for a while. Just uh, rewind the tape. So if you have a VCR that's not fast forwarding or, or rewinding and eating the tape, be sure to check that uh, pendulum arm. 
here's um, something that I found. This is a commercial tape that uh, was given to me. You notice it says 30 minutes. You know that this is really going to look good, right? This was a commercial tape that was actually sold and it's recorded in EP. You want to see bad quality? Check this out. Yes, you've seen it in magazines, you've read it in the newspapers. In fact, perhaps you've even seen the owner's picture. Ralph Williams, the owner of Bay Shore Chrysler Plymouth, 345 of Camille Real in the city of San Bruno. You notice the big bald headed son of a bitch? The man that came to San Francisco to offer them more for the dollar they spent. The man that came to San Francisco to rape each and every citizen and the whole San Francisco Bay Area. You don't believe it? Listen to me. I don't lie. Take a fucking guy like this. A 1966 Ford, a country squire knife factory thing to like it. Don't worry about the equipment. Imagine all the fun you can have in the back. And while you're doing it, imagine all the money that that bald headed prick is going to be making on the car he's caught trying to fuck you out of. Yes, the man that will take every dime out of the San Francisco Bay Area and spend it on prostitutes, booze, and of course crap tables in the city of Las Vegas. I'm sure you've heard about it. So remember this. If you'd like to get fucked, they work real hard. Before you buy a car, come down here. Let Ralph Williams do it. Why not? Why, why not somebody else? Remember our address at 345 El Camino Real in the city of San Bruno, but if you come from Marin County, East Bay Area, San Jose, your money spends just as well as anybody else's. And when this bald in son of a bitch gets all of it, you will spend money. Talking about payments, five years payments of $100 a month. You can't get even. So shop before you buy, pay sure, Chrysler Plymouth. <laughs>